And the first poems I'd like to read are read with thanks to Nancy Peters Hastings, now of Las Cruces, New Mexico, who published them in whole notes. Nancy also was my Greek teacher. The first is at the Angel tube station, and I need to say a little about this. We had a year, my family and I, in London in 1976-77, and our subway or underground station was called the Angel. And it is probably the ugliest station in all of England. It is really horrendously awful and depressing. And you have to wait a long time as well. So one day, my son Scott was with me, and we, to kill time, had walked all the way down to the end, which meant that we could get off faster at the next stop. But at any rate, we got imaginative, and we thought, what could be done <laughs> to make this a nicer place to be? So we worked this out. Let us engage frescoists, perhaps from Urbino, and let them paint 11,000 angels on the walls, walls that are also ceiling, as in the sign for infinity, here in the angel station. Let them be blonde, wavy-haired, pastel-garmented angels, emitting ribbons of gilded Latin from their lauding mouths. Let them be peacock-winged, suavely feathered, some of flight, others playing orchestras of anachronistic instruments, bellowed portative organs, viola de gamba, recorders, lutes, perhaps no harps. And let them greet pilgrims who, having descended into the depths via the lift, or by infernally steep stairs, expect to find hell, find instead a paradise of blue and rose and gold. Another poem Nancy published in Whole Notes is entitled White Rabbit on a Green Field Lambent, which means shining. Our boys had pet rabbits that were very beautiful. And uh, being a city child, I knew very little about animals. And I was amazed at how wonderfully, aesthetically rabbit-like this real rabbit was. <laughs> so, so with a clear homage here to Christopher Smart, who wrote a long poem about his cat, here's a rather short one about the white rabbit. This rabbit blesses by his presence, for here there is no disappointment, this creature being the fulfillment of his essence. C. Miel Fleur Tapestry, German Woodcut and Nursery Book. Hence, expectation is fulfilled and runneth over. His rabbit fur-like fur, his ears mapped with tributary veining that move aside as I feel the fine trough in his head, his hind leg remarkable in its scratching of an ear, his droppings an unlikely convenience of simplicity, how alive he throbs, his body at one with his heart. A real rabbit alone of all living kind is more himself than static kin, as in the aforesaid Mio Fleur tapestry, German woodcut and nursery book. Then, uh, a third poem Nancy published is a very short one entitled Night Song. The bird that did that sometime night knock on my pain to my delight did bolt, did pitch, did scarp, did sing, and filed my heart on his bright wing. And then, 
Since Vicki has already referred to it, I seize this opportunity to read my poem and the essay about it in the current issue of Nebraska Humanities. And my thanks to Jennifer Bowman and Hilda Roz for, for this. There is no place in Nebraska. This negative landscape is not to love. It undulates, but at the trucker's pace. No sigh-inspiring lambs, just sentenced steers. No color force to draw and suck the eye. The camouflage of war is here. Khaki, leached green, sad brown, and wasted gray. No park, just trees to try to break the wind. No crafted houses fresh as paint to boast householders' joy and cheer of lot. Instead, taxpayers' prudence to evade the law that calls to forfeit pride in husbandry. This view is like folk remedy of jokes. It feels so good when you no longer look, your other aches and pains recede. I wrote this sonnet in the spring of 1977 when I was in Britain with my family. The germ of the poem is sigh-inspiring lambs. We were on a train in the Welsh countryside with friends from the south now teaching in South Dakota. The landscape was green and misty, watered with creeks, streams, small waterfalls, and it was hilly, Wordsworth's landscape. In my memory, each relatively level space is filled with gambling lambs. What we were seeing was a revelation. As a Chicagoan, I had thought lambs made that lyrical leap only in children's books and over fences in cartoons when insomniacs count sheep. Each time we saw more gambling lambs, we collectively sighed. We sighed a lot. Under these circumstances, I could be a shepherdess, I remember saying, and everyone laughed. But then I thought of returning to Nebraska, where I've often imagined Keats's Ruth, who, sick for home, stood in tears amid the alien corn. And then I've wept, not always metaphorically, for wide water and trees. This is not to say that I can't do a teacherly job of waxing eloquent on the aesthetic of the plains. I have plenty of material to draw on. Paintings, photographs, and poems by many Nebraskans. In Mulla Cather's fiction, however, I find literary justification for alienation from this landscape as well as its supreme peons of praise. Not only does Alexandra Bergson turn longing eyes to the prairie, but Godfrey St. Peter needs to see Lake Michigan, which Cather felicitously calls the Inland Sea, at least once a year to maintain some semblance of mental and emotional equilibrium. Like Cather's professor, I too spent those imprinting early years watching the sunrise over the Great Lake, and like him, I ache at its absence. That is how I came to write a poem that presents a negative view of Nebraska's landscape. I chose a traditional form to express the ideas, ideas that play off English pastoral poems of the 18th and 19th centuries, hence the distance and somewhat archaic language. I wrote it not only out of frustration with the landscape, but with the minimally maintained farmhouses I look at during my hour and a half, five day a week commute to Crete. The title plays off Gertrude Stein's arch description of Oakland, where she grew up across the bay from splendid San Francisco. There is no there, there. It also draws on the aesthetic of the plains as a negative idea since the landscape lacks the positive elements of an irregular or contained skyline. After two decades, I still feel uncomfortable with the landscape, although I find some relief thinking of Native Americans drawing a circle around themselves to find some comforting containment, especially when I recall that the Plains Indians were also transplanted. When I teach Plains literature, 
I used two emblems for the course, the circle, black elks, and broken hoop, and the tower, Nebraska's state capital. The latter exemplifies Wright Morris's statement that so much flatness demands an occasional vertical. Consider the silos. Consider the falsely high storefronts and regard my sonnet and its commentary as a voice in loyal opposition. <laughs> now, Howard Kay made a wonderful illustration for the poem and essay. Catherine Endicott told me today that it's a Charlie Calf. And uh, this gave me an opportunity to read a short poem that I wrote and dedicated to Howard some years ago when I bought a watercolor from his series of elephants. And the one we have has a very green elephant that still looks very much like an elephant. It's just that it's rich, rich green. Howard's elephant. The insouciant pachyderm, malachite flesh a swing, hangs loose. With a lope of the trunk to mark his place, weighs him. To trumpet his presence, no need. Two dimensions of the stentorian beast inflate exponentially when he's looked at in his momentary frame. Next, an essay. And I wrote about eight years ago about the house we live in. It's entitled, Stone Walls Do Not a Castle Make. We live in a house that smells like a castle, though it is in Lincoln, Nebraska. Misleadingly, 1735 is carved in stone over the ironclad door, for it is a 1920s Tudor house built by an Anglophile contractor named Homer Virgil Martin for his own family. That, like his namesakes, Homer thought big, is reflected in the 57 windows he put in. New neighbors across the street told me that they've been calling it the fraternity house. As it happens, that appellation isn't far from the mark, given the gender distribution of both our immediate and extended families. Indeed, I often feel like a house mother among husbands, sons, their friends, brothers-in-law, etc. But how appropriate it is that a couple who teach, read, and write about English literature, having one son who writes plays and another who gets exercised over what Thucydides reports, should live in a house with ties to the past. On the cynical side, one can draw analogies. One can speak of enfolded anachronisms, they who, in effect, engage in the manufacture of buggy whips, as Calvin Trillin wrote when he covered an annual meeting of the Modern Language Association for the New Yorker, deserve to live in a house with 11 rooms but one place to bathe, a house with radiators that make the cost of thorough air conditioning prohibitive. Ours, then, is a house with what real estate agents in the university towns politely refer to as academic ambience. When they come up the sidewalk with prospective buyers or renters, the phrase means the house will not be neat because there are too many books, among other undesirable features. So much for our house, mellowed with middle-aged, if not medieval, living. But the real medieval living that went on in castles did, I think, have much in common with fraternity life. After decades of reading medieval literature itself, the word castle no longer conjures up a pre-Raphaelite lady of Shalott weaving on a circular loom for me, nor Guinevere recalling to her woodcut William Morris judges how she had held up her long transparent hand against the blue of a stone wall enclosed sky on the day Lancelot came within a yard of her bright sleeves. Nor for that matter do I recall illuminations from books of ours. Instead, I think of fraternity houses filled with competitive, randy young men who like to drink, eat, and eat, and who sometimes sing and tell tall tales by way of pumping up their reputations. But young men who are, above all, characterized by attitudes of us against whatever, them. First time we went to England, where we saw real castles, 
We were contracting to buy our house, which was then in a red-lined district. The bank we had applied to for a mortgage thought it was irresponsible of us to go to Europe. It was only England then. When, as professors in their 30s, we had more adult responsibilities, such as buying a house and becoming genuine burgers, that is to say, respectably middle class. Though the commitment to go to England had been made months before, the real problem for the bank was its officer's equation of respectability with suburban living. Thus, anxiety about getting the house, coupled with the fact of never having lived in the house, and all that summer long, far away in the demi-paradise, my imagination constructed a house ne'er seen on sea or land. But a real aspect of the actual house, one that persisted accurately by involuntary recall, was an odor of stony mustiness. An odor that reasserts itself even now if the house is empty for a few days, or if I do not maintain an elaborate system of open windows and fans in the summer. Thus did our house come to me on winding stone stairs and towers that our boys stormed and clamored up. Once our house came to me in the modest, stately home of the local nobility at Ascot under Witchwood, a small Cotswold village near Oxford where we lived for a month, the local aristocrats, a sir and lady some such, had opened their house for an annual cancer benefit. A curious occasion it was, curious at least to Midwestern Americans, in that the money raising seemed to accrue from the sale of used clothing called jumble and old but unused kitchen towels. Anyhow, as I stood on a flagstone floor of sprain, spine abrading hardness, Looking at pieces of foxes decorating the lentils, our house in Lincoln came to me. For there it was, that penetrating, acrid odor of stone enclosed domesticity. It's not only stone, however, but stone that has absorbed the sense of daily life through the most primitive of the senses. Moreover, it must be the sense of life lived on the boil rather than on prescribed occasions where the rules have been laid down and the game set. It's stone enclosing that particular mustiness that will always summon up our house for me. It is not, mark you, a smell that hangs in the air of stone churches. Perhaps then it is merely the odor of preternaturally preserved habitation, odors of food cooked, of sweated clothes, of bodily effluvia. Churches, I repeat, don't give it off. Nor is it simply a matter of incense and beeswax as cover-up. Another kind of life went on and still goes on in ritually hallowed precincts. Essentials are offered up or sung about in sanctified formulae. The millennium of the Middle Ages, as well as the succeeding centuries of counter-reformation, were not times of spontaneously addressing the deity aloud in public. Few waves of articulated or growled emotion beat upon those stones once they were consecrated, never mind the physical stress and pain that must have accompanied their erection. Consider, for example, what happened when Richard II struck in anger a noble who had arrived late to the funeral mass for his beloved Anne of Bohemia. The liturgy was stopped and rites of holy oils undid the sacrilege. Nor could the prelates overlook the breach of ecclesiastical etiquette by considering the source, whether attributable to kingly rage or exorious grief. If perhaps we had holy oils to spill upon the desecrated floors of stone houses, there would be no accumulation of mustiness. Is negative emotion then exorcisable? Or does it take on a peculiar life of its own when it is enclosed by the ancient broken bodies of calcified sea life that lived long before human voices spoke blessings or imprecations? But there is a contemporary, an alarming hazard to our way of life, or at least it is one that royals, nobles, and their faithful retainers in the benighted past were spared knowledge of. Living in a stone house increases our chances of getting cancer. 
I had read that item somewhere and ran it past a physicist who said, sure, a matter of radiation it seems. Statistical, of course, but statistics seem more and more real as I advance along the tables of mortality. But Homer Virgil Martin, bless him, died in this house in his 90s. So, I live in a house that smells like a castle. I breathe in and breathe out odors, the beginnings and endings of all life. My breath is my own end, as was my own beginning. On my stone house, sanctified nonetheless by the secular life lived herein, unfolding through the order of the centuries, I ask that a sweet oil of venison be poured in secula seculorum. Amen. This next one you'll find is, again, related to our Willa Cather. And the explanation of this essay is about as long as the piece itself, but it's necessary. It's entitled, Cather Knocks Out Hemingway in the 15th Round. In May 1984, James Woodruff remarked in his keynote address at the annual Cather Day in Red Cloud that some 18 years earlier, when a bibliography of critical writings on 20, 20th century American writers was assembled, Willa Cather barely got on the list, while Hemingway's inclusion was assumed. In 1984, Woodruff pointed out the situation would be reversed. Cather would be included without question, while there might be some discussion about whether to include Hemingway. That is, Hemingway would be pitted against other contenders. There is, of course, irony in the fact that Willa Cather's critical reputation, and probably her brute number of readers, has outdistanced Hemingway's. Consider, however, that while Cather's style is deceptively simple, Hemingway's is simply deceptive. <laughs> Juxtapose this spreading realization with the truism that Hemingway's famous style, a style that often seems unreadable now, or even laughable, was adapted from Gertrude Stein's. Nevertheless, the recent flurry of books about Stein and the influence of her style suggests a longer-lasting presence in American letters for Hemingway's model than for her comparatively shallow adapter. Gertrude said, Hemingway, after all, you are 90% Rotarian. <laughs> Moreover, Cather's style, though not learned at Gertrude Stein's feet, does have certain elements in common with hers. Most notably, both were quintessentially American. Indeed, Cather's Song of the Lark was turned down by an English publisher because he found the American idiom oppressive. A dually idiosyncratic instance, both women writers acutely attuned to oral as well as visual appearances regarded American soldiers as embodiments of what it was to be American. In person, both women were stocky, both had voices that were deep and rich as well as pleasing to their hearers, both wore their hair either very short or pulled back severely. Both made affectional attachments to women. Further, where Cather had grown up, there was less there, there, than in Oakland. This leads us to a major angle of comparison, the aesthetic. Both Stein and Cather were from places that left them aesthetically dissatisfied. While Stein left Oakland for good, Cather had a horror of dying in a Nebraska cornfield. Both experienced a psychic homecoming in France. Both were extraordinarily practical esthetes for their day. As aesthetic subjects, or as aesthetic objects that were at the same time subjects, both posed for significant portraits painted by European painters. Portraits which influence our perceptions of them, as well as portraits whose images they grew into. Stein's by Picasso, whom she considered a genius. Cather's by Basque, whom she considered the most interesting painter around. Both, though unconventional in dress, assumed styles that suited them. 
both always alert, both always in on the significant from the beginning, not only in the arts, but in the making of art themselves. Stein reveled in the obscure destinies of her charity patients in Baltimore, while Cather found her material in her memories of Nebraska emigrants. How then would one comment in the spirit of Gertrude Stein, using her style within her frame of reference on this eminently satisfying reversal in fortune between an acknowledged culture hero of time past and a subtler and sounder writer with whom Stein herself had much in common. It is interesting. Cather knocks out Hemingway in the 15th round with Willa Cather, 1873 to 1947 in this corner. Ernest Hemingway, 1899 to 1961 in that corner. And Gertrude Stein, 1874 to 1946 as referee. One, there was one among the silos yearning, yearning to be someone, to be someone not among the silos, but to be one. This someone, yearning among the silos, yearning to be someone not among the silos, but among the silos somewhere else, somewhere else where they are not called silos, but are called something else, this one, yearning, yearning among the silos to be somewhere, somewhere else, but among silos with a name that is not silos. So this one, moving on the flats, among the verticals, took a vertical in hand, and thereby left the flats with the silos, and moved because of a vertical on the flat to the flats where there are other verticals that are not called silos, but are called something else. That one, was one where there was somewhere. There is a there, there in Oak Park. There are buildings that are beautiful in the looking back and in the looking now. This one who was somewhere was fragile, for this one was one who did not tell his own story, nor did he know that remarks are not literature. So in his writing he put a lot of how to do things, how to do things like boxing shadows and tiring bulls and catching fish and having pain. But that one, being interested only in the inside of him, felt no desire to express the rhythm of the visible world. Here we come to a parting of their ways. Here we come to what this one had that that one hadn't. Here we come to the crux of the matter. Here we see, here we see, that this one who saw the outside through her inside brought the outside inside only to bring the outside, outside from her inside for the world to see. After all, anybody is as their land and air is. Anybody is as the sky is low or high, the air heavy or clear. Anybody is as there is wind or no wind there. It is that which makes them, and the arts they make, and the work they do, and the way they eat, and the way they drink, and the way they learn, and everything. Though there was no there there for her, she found a there inside her from the there that was not there and put it outside her for everyone and anyone to see. And so now they see it. Some there were who always saw it. That one had a there there, but inside him there was little or nothing there, which is why he had passionately interested rather than interesting eyes. That is why, though, he sat in front of Gertrude Stein and listened and looked, and though he listened and looked, he neither heard nor saw. There comes a time, there comes a time when the thing seen changes and that makes a composition. A composition is made and a classic is found, and what is not a classic, what is not beautiful, what does not have the outside brought inside to go outside again made anew, that cannot win that cannot be a classic, that cannot be beautiful. But Gertrude Stein had a weakness for Ernest, still in all, and he helped her when she was making the making of Americans, and that is something. But there was someone, someone yearning among the cornfields, and this one made something, this one made something, made something American, 
made something that is classic and beautiful and was Gertrude Stein's contemporary QED. I'd like to read um, another essay. This is going to appear in the spring issue of the Virginia Woolf Miscellany. It's a memoir of Lola Slotitz. When I first worked at the Berg Collection in the summer of 1966, Lola Slotitz was Dr. John Gordon's assistant. Since the Wolf materials were as yet uncatalogued, working with them was a matter of special permission and exploration of terra incognita. My situation was complicated by having only three days in New York, but those three days were a marvel of logistical arrangement with my family since my sons were then one and two years old. I was at work on my dissertation for Emory, which I was doing from the other side of the country in Berkeley. I knew that J.J. Wilson had made the pilgrimage to the Berg, and in the tradition of my Catholic girlhood, buttressed by medieval literature, I felt that as a true devotee, I would have to pay homage to the holy relics. I do not write this sardonically. It was not only the way I felt, but the way I continue to feel. I saw such a wealth of material during those days and wanted to work with so much of it that note-taking was unsatisfactory. I was, therefore, given permission to have their photostats made, though I would have to return them to the Berg after a certain period of time. Having judged me to be obviously an honest person, Dr. Slotitz recommended to Dr. Gordon that I be trusted. When he agreed, I felt as if Louis XIV had granted me a royal estate. When I returned the white on black sheets from Nebraska in 1968, addressed to Dr. Gordon, Lola Slotitz wrote an acknowledgement but added that she assumed I hadn't been reading the newspapers because I should have known that Dr. Gordon had died. On the one hand, I could have taken her irritation as the provincialism of a New Yorker who had never seen or given thought to what would fill the pages of a newspaper in the capital of an agricultural state. On the other hand, I agreed with her about what is important. In the following year, she would sometimes greet me warmly and warn me of all the others who were working on Virginia Woolf. Once, she asked, demanded to know actually what I had been doing instead of, or in addition to, what I should be doing, that is, working at the Berg and publishing on Virginia Woolf. Teaching at a small liberal arts college and rearing sons, I said, she harumphed and walked away. My memoir of those days would be incomplete if I did not include the new suit. This is a, a kind of allusion to a Virginia Woolf short story called The New Dress. Before leaving Berkeley, I wanted an outfit to wear at the Berg that would not only look professional, but would enable me to withstand summer humidity in other parts of the country. I therefore bought a yellow seersucker suit at a shop in Berkeley that sold pre-Columbian artifacts. Looking the part of a serious young academic matron, I had to guess at how I should look. There were a few models. It came as a shock that the head waiter at the old Commodore Hotel, where my father had stayed during several decades of business trips, became apoplectic at 5.30 one evening when I left the table by the swinging door of the kitchen to which he had exiled me in a nearly empty cavernous dining room to join at an adjacent table my professor of Thomistic philosophy at Barra College, who was there to speak at a conference. Had the head waiter been a clever investigator, he would have realized from our conversation that I was not approaching a man for immoral purposes on premises for which he, as head waiter, was responsible. What was at issue, I later learned, was a fine applicable under a city ordinance. Annoyed and perplexed as I was at the time, this incident more than any feminist argument I make to my Nebraska students, illustrates to them the peculiar liabilities women work under. 
Otherwise, my straightest of summer suits made me fear for my life at blending into the double yellow line I got stranded on when I unwisely crossed 42nd Street in the middle of the block. Clearly, indulging in patience was not prudent for visitors from Berkeley. Still, those three days in 1966 set a pattern for the rest of my life. I continue to think of the Berg Collection as sacred space, though now perhaps more in the sense of a temple where one seeks resolution of uneasiness through concentration and rest to the spirit provided by the ancient rite of incubation. Lola Slotitz, through the example of her dedication to what can be salvaged and preserved from the past, has her part in this metaphor as a relentlessly focused idealist. And now a poem entitled Partial Eclipse, May 30th, 19. 84. I watched gibbous moons projected through holes in styrofoam cups parade as suns on pavement in Nebraska. Meanwhile, my second son in Chicago saw conjuries of the above through blowing leaves, knowing it would be two weeks before another full moon, schooled as he was in astrophysics. A friend, a physicist, endured washout on a family trip to Maryland. He'd planned to seize the moment whole. A memory intervenes. I check it against what I've learned of oral history and what middle age has taught me a flexuous memory, that Mobius band. My grandmother spoke, surely, of a total eclipse a century ago in Cincinnati. Dogs howl. My great-grandfather tells them, all eight surviving children. Dogs howl. His wife? Dogs howl. Tells them to go inside. They hide under beds and miss it all. And this is one I wrote a long time ago. Our sons are now as tall as we, and uh, their attitude toward teeth has changed. This is entitled Accounting. As gold fragments litter a spent mine, my son's teeth jumble in my bathrobe pockets, while, like a weary official of a prospering company, I assay these rootless ivory pellets taken from under their pillows and exchanged for small coin. The boys rejoice to lose a tooth, see it as a personal accomplishment, look forward to their recompense from the tooth fairy, who, unlike me, is ageless but not believed in, truly. Your mother, I tell them, kept her last baby tooth till she was 39. Good God, I add, don't let that go beyond the house. The idea being, that unlike them, who so prodigally throw themselves away, I can serve. Oh, I can serve. This next one I wrote some time ago, and I do have a much better arrangement now for spending long hours at a computer. But when I first started to use a computer, the description here is, is relevant. My father died in 1978. My father's gifts. Sometimes I find dollar bills like those he hid in the back flap of a file of facts he had made himself. But the facts he filed in his angry 80s were page after page of the contents of his desk drawer by drawer, fountain pens that sometimes needed ink. One special pen has never been made to write an addendum on brown paper stuck on the manila envelope, can containing pocket lighters. They're on display in the living room, bespeaking as they do the enameled 1920s magnifying glass, engraving block, instruments, instruments, etc. 
once in an ochre metal tube advertising Dr. Scholl's moleskin, I found a cache of sharpened pencils, number twos, exactly what I needed. My feet could wait. But his desk that I brought to Nebraska over protests, that desk is ugly. He had lost his craftsman's taste, though not his craftsman's eye. Plywood flawlessly joined in drawers, splays 1950s legs. A door on top with a piece of glass that didn't fit because it had been cut from my girlhood dressing table. But I'm using it because it has a big surface and drawers wherein I found much of the above. But then there is the Greek stool he made. Curved legs, thronged, thonged leather seat, all flawlessly joined and in good wood. I use it at the computer, which in turn sits on a box he made for the inside of a commercial walnut chest to hold my silk scarves. The computer is on the maple dinette table. I learned to type on with an oil green Smith Corona portable surrounded by dark green walls beside Lake Michigan in Chicago. The Greek stool eases my back while I use the computer. I use the Greek stool rather than the matching maple dinette chair because being ageless, it also takes a pillow. The maple chair says 1940s solidity, American virtue. Its scooped out seat does not conform to mine. This poem is entitled A Potsherd, and uh, this one is dedicated to our younger son, Bennett the Finder. It has to do with an outing we had to a poet's house, poet novelist named Martin Booth, who at that time lived in Notting, Bedfordshire. This was in 1977. And, uh, he, he said that uh, after tea, we'd go out and find shards of pots the Romans had left. Totally assured that that would happen, and, and, and it did. There were that many. So Bennett was the winner for finding things. One, shards underground long enough when they are crude enough come to look like bones. Here, a fragment, oddly flesh in tone. Two, some Romans were engineers. Consider, for example, soldiers assigned to Britain. Probably not many citizens among them, rather men from the provinces themselves. Once you're out of Rome, it's all provinces. Three, what did they do those long hours off duty in fog and mist besides curse the climate? No need to build aqueducts, but small troughs for funneling might have been diverting. Four, the Chinese read augury from bones heated till they crack. If I look at paralleled incised lines on a bone-like shard that has crossed an ocean and half a continent. What does it tell me of Romans who regarded Britain as exile, or of myself? Stay underground long enough, and you too might become the stuff of myths, because you wear amber, because you read Virgil, because you read Thomas Hardy, who wrote of amber, found in Dorset, and who liked bones. I'd like to end with a poem that um, I wrote in 1975 <laughs> because I, I'd like to 
end on a rather affirmative note, and this one is, is not as relatively um, strict as, as some of the others. In fact, this one uh, is kind of emotional. It's what I had in mind was the Pandaric Ode, no less, and um, I didn't <laughs> quite do that. But uh, the occasion was the USSR USA Junior Track and Field Qualifying Meet held in Lincoln, July 5th, 1975, and we took the boys. And it was one of those hotter than hot days. And I don't like being out in the sun, and I'm not athletic, but I was totally engrossed in this. And I tried to, to express what I saw and, and felt in this, this very um, loose poem. They are as art deco sculpture, these women relay runners at their stride, legs extended farther than in sculpture requiring a base, one black, her hair Somalian in closeness for unobstructed speed, hurls her legs as if they were a segai, another, though white, bounds like the remarkable animals of Africa on the belt. How does one stay on the heat-bleached cheap seats watching this? I too am loose of muscle, slow of heart, mindless in speed, springing, kicking, and what I have dreamed of as a child out of winter-heavy shoes running down a grassy slope. But they and the 10,000-meter men and the men in the steeplechase, they run in high heat on pink latex surface and their suffering becomes their body's glorious martyrdom, purified by prairie fires of wavering heat. A child with an artificial leg, she too, inspired by the liberty of movement, flings herself along the track, hair glued and wild as a contender's, under the bleachers she goes, swings about despite her unbending leg in the slatted shade. She stoops, she lopes, she swoops, picking things up, all in search of movement, which like mine is mostly in the head. Her shorts show that the absence of one leg is total, but her purple velvet halter shows her upper limbs sound. O oh, child, that you should be clad in regal victor's cloth. Why is she here? Who has brought her? What cruelty if premeditated? Yet she thrives and is carried on the victorious shoulders of the atmosphere in the heat, in the spirit of flight, though her unbending leg keeps her more than humanly bound to earth. Thank you.